Good morning, everyone. How are you? All right, the hall's filling up nicely. This is going to be an incredible panel. Fake news is what we're talking about here. Uh, we're going to tackle it by trying to put into context what we've seen happening <coughs> in Pakistan. This is a Lahore Literary Festival, but of course, fake news has been happening all over the world. Um, I am an American journalist. I'm based here in New York. I report for ABC News. I covered the last presidential cycle and now anchor a lot of our political coverage. I've had the privilege of being labeled an enemy of my own people by our president, so it's a fun time to be a journalist. But um, I'm here in search of understanding how we got here, how fake news thrives, in what conditions it thrives, and also in search of answers, how we move forward from here. So we could not have put together a more incredible panel. Each one of you on your own I could talk to easily for hours, so to have you all together is really, really quite a privilege. And I hope you'll all join me in thanking them for being here as I do a brief introduction of everyone. Tom Freston, former CEO and COO of Viacom, former chairman and CEO of MTV Networks, now a key advisor to, uh, sorry, to many media outlets, including Vice Media and Overseas. I want to talk a bit more about that. Also an inductee of the Television Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. And earlier in your career, I want to talk about this another time, you ran textile businesses in Afghanistan and India. I we did. We can talk about it another time. <laughs> Um, next up, Ahmed Rashid, you were introduced briefly by Ruzi as well, but of course, journalist, best-selling author of so many books focusing on Central Asia and South Asia. You continue to write for the Daily Telegraph, International Herald Tribune, BBC, and others. And of course, Ambassador Robin Rafel, um, you've spent decades in diplomatic service to your country here, representing U.S. interests in arguably some of the most difficult and fraught relationships on the very front lines. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Please join me in welcoming them. So let's talk about fake news, where it comes from. It is nothing new, it's fair to say, although we're talking about it here in the States as if it is, because by and large it is here. Uh, Stephen Cook of uh, Council on Foreign Relations had shared a recent story about how long fake news has been around. He wrote a policy report about Egypt and he was sharing a story uh, in his recent writing about how a fake news outlet in the Middle East grabbed his old report, relabeled it by stamping it with a classified stamp, changing the date to two days before this last inauguration, and then republishing it by saying, the Trump administration is worried about what's happening in Egypt. So he was putting it into context by saying it's nothing new. It's been happening in countries across the world for a very long time. I'd love to hear from each of you, because you come from such unique backgrounds in your terms of your career, where you have seen fake news, and also what those societal ills are, I'm using Mr. Cook's words here, that are sort of the common thread. How do places become vulnerable to the spread or proliferation of fake news? And Ambassador Rafel, maybe you can kick us off. Okay, well thank you very much, and it's indeed a pleasure to be here, and I was so glad to see the Lahore Literary Festival come to New York, uh, closer to my hometown of Washington, D.C. Um, I think everyone can agree that uh, there, we're in a period of conflict, transition, globally in all societies, American as well as Pakistani, um, which, and technological change, population movements, all of these things which create a kind of anxiety, global angst. Uh, we certainly saw it here in the 2016 election. I'm sure you covering it uh, recognized all of those things. So I think those are the kinds of, of global threads that make every society more vulnerable than it might have been to this whole phenomenon of, of believing something without really challenging the source and so on, uh, if it's something that fits into their fears or underscores their prejudices. Mr. Rashid, what do you think? Well, I agree with you. I mean, fake news has been around uh, an awful long time. And uh, in, in our own um, uh, period, if you look at the Second World War, I mean, Churchill and um, Stalin were allies and later enemies, but they were constantly using ruses of fake news to try and out, outdo the other. While the war was going on, look at the Cold War. I mean, what the CIA got up to, what the KGB got up to, um, uh, putting out fake news, trying to influence the media, um, which was much simpler in those days because you had one or two or three channels. You didn't have dozens of channels. So, but I think the big difference has come when states and leaders and governments start, uh, are not just using fake news, but individuals are. 
And the really big danger is now that individuals, corporations, companies, groups of people um, on the political left or the political right, they are now in a power to actually generate fake news, as the story you told. And that's where there is absolutely no stopping now as to where this <coughs> is going on. I mean, we've seen uh, what Russia did, uh, or we haven't yet fully seen what Russia tried to do in the American elections. We are already seeing what Russia is trying to do in the French elections uh, with the backing of Le Pen. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, individuals associated with this or that side are using fake news in very much the same way. Mr. Preston, what about you? Well, the history of governments bending the truth or journalists bending the truth, there's a long history of that. There's a long history of propaganda once mass media came along. And I've got to say that the, the, the nomenclature, fake news, had kind of innocent beginnings. I used to work with John Stewart on The Daily Show. And when he would go on other media outlets to explain what he was doing on The Daily Show, he says, well, I'm, a fa I'm the fake news guy. <laughs> and it, fake news was sort of the satirical take on the news. It was about real news, but some of the inconsistencies and, you know, some fun that you could find within it. But it really has been the birth, not the birth, but the growth of the Internet, and in particular social media, that has allowed fake news to really... You know, it's, in the old days, you could, you could look at a newsstand and you could see visual cues as to what, which news that you see, The Economist or Time Magazine or whatever, and you would know that they're very different from the supermarket tabloids mm -hmm. that, that traded in fake stories all the time. But now you'd have uh, a, an investigative piece by, say, The Washington Post next to a piece about a pizza gate, you know, about a sex, child sex ring that existed you know, as part of the Clinton campaign, sitting side by side on someone's news feed on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult. They're, they're given almost equal importance. And it's very increasingly difficult. And it's going to get much more difficult in the future for people to discern between one and the other. And probably the Pizzagate story would have more engagement in terms of, you know, traction and people reading and understanding it. Uh, so it's, it, this is... I think we're really at the beginnings of what's going to develop into a much, much bigger problem for us. Well, let's talk about that. What is at stake here? Um, because as we're seeing in new media, um, with the proliferation of digital media, there, there, it's easy for anyone to create a story, to spread it, but you also have an incredible level of sophistication behind that amplification of the message. Now, we saw with Russia with regards to the U.S. election. Uh, Clint Watts, who testified before the Senate Intelligence Committee, laid out in very detailed fashion how the government and officials went about creating messages, seeding stories, and then spreading them with circular messaging. And there's no, as you mentioned, there's no putting it back in the bottle once it's out there. So what is at stake here with this level of sophistication? What, how do we handle that as a society? Anyone is willing to I, that I, class. I, I think the real fear is that, um, um, as, as, you know, as Tom is saying, it's going to get much worse. Uh, and we're all going to become liars, basically. Those who put out fake news are essentially lying to the public. And the danger is, of course, this could, could, could extend into medical areas where you, you give out that these pills are safe when they're not safe, or almost any other area of activity where you, know, you, you justify it and say, this is fine, you can do this, when actually it might be a very big danger to do it. And so the fact that corporations and companies and investment houses and banks could all start using fake news or, you know, because it's now become almost legit in a way. Um, and that is a real danger if your whole economy and social system um, starts using fake news in a completely uncontrolled way. To think about this for a moment, most of the fake news that we see so far has been in text form. Right now, technology is moving forward, and it's soon going to be in video and audio. Mm -hmm. Right now, you, you could get video from someone and manipulate the facial movements of people and have them say different things and move their mouth around it, done with their own voice. All you have to do is take someone's voice for 20 minutes and record it, and basically you can make that person say anything in their own voice. So imagine... Prime Minister Modi, if you will, saying to his defense minister on video that we're going to have some type of attack against Pakistan if something happens. I mean, and that's going to grow like a virus immediately. And you've already seen in Pakistan with the, the tweet about the Israeli nuclear, yes. you know, how quickly things can go. But when things get into video and audio, it's going to be so much more powerful and so much more difficult for people to 
parse between what's real and what isn't. Well, you've all had to deal with trying to present the truth in some way to whoever it is that you're, you're serving. Ambassador Rafel, I'd love to hear from you. When you're out there on the front lines and you see misinformation being spread and being weaponized like that, how do you handle it? What do you do? Well, a couple of things. Um, one, I would say that um, thus far, what have we done as a, as a government in the diplomatic service is to counter fake news with the truth, um, uh, using not only the normal sort of journalist channels, but also we have a big effort at the State Department now with social media, and every embassy we have has a Facebook platform and Twitter feed and all the rest. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the U.S. government, in that regard, is trying to compete in that space. But I think it does become very difficult for anybody uh, because, as you say, as the technology moves on, the fight becomes harder and harder, you know, the, the confrontation. One thing I would also say on a slightly different tack that what has been difficult for U.S. diplomats abroad over the last year is explaining to other publics how we got into the particular fake news cycle that we got into during the election. That has been a real challenge. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> With difficulty. But what I, what I think we need to do, because you can see that, that the, the cycle, uh, it's just going to become such a vicious cycle with the technology becoming more sophisticated and so on, is we've got to sort of step back and say, okay, what kind of a broad educational intervention can we use to begin to get a handle on this? Uh, and I think that's very important. I've heard librarians now talk about uh, programs in the American Association of Librarians, very broad platform in the United States to help begin to educate people to recognize fake news. Uh, the whole idea that Facebook is now hiring a bunch of people to patrol so that they can uh, uh, intervene when there's an obvious fake news story, mm -hmm. putting markers on stories, little pop-ups that say, um, you know, this may not, you know, the sources of the story aren't known, are you sure you want to retweet it, or, you know, so on and so forth. So I think this educational aspect of it uh, here in America, and, you know, hopefully if we get a model going, it would be, uh, replicated in other countries who would also bring their own ideas into it because we need to do something from a, you know, a, in a macro way to look at this and educate people to begin to recognize some of the easy signs of fake news. What about day to day in, in sort of the trenches of information warfare? In the trenches, yeah. you know, you call people up and say this is it. one of the, I'll give you an example, one of the persistent stories we had in Islamabad, and Ahmed would know this. We were building a new embassy building, which was quite large <laughs> and imposing in the diplomatic enclave. And there was a persistent story that there were going to be 2,000 American Marines <laughs> in the basement of this building. We did everything. We, you know, talked to journalists. We brought journalists in to visit the site and so on to, so that they could see that there weren't hidden barracks uh, and so on and so forth. But it, it's very difficult. And the advantage is to the technology. There's no doubt about that, which is why I think ultimately education is an important part. Mr. Preston, what do you think, in your role as a, a board advisor to Vice now, you're overseeing an incredibly influential emerging news voice, um, incredibly trusted by a huge demographic, not just here in the States, but around the world. What's the role of media, of journalists, in trying to tackle this? Is it up to them to literally try to catch all the misinformation and sort through it, or just ignore it and charge full, full force ahead? Well, it's, you know, trying to be really fact-based and tr let facts kind of override what some overriding narrative might be and have various sources and and not trying to, to fall into any traps. I mean, the, the people's opinion of the media these days is very low. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really polarized time, and, you know, one person's fake news is another person's fact. So maybe the way to do that is to try and get back to the basic roots of good journalism and, and report facts as you see them, try and show both sides, not in a uh, sort of, you know, light-handed way, but really thoroughly. And... Uh, count on being able to engage your viewers as seeing you as a source for truth, someone who fights for truth. If you look in this country, 
you go back to when the media was held in high esteem, which was, say, during the 70s when we had Watergate and the whole issue with uh, the Washington Post and Nixon and so forth, held in very high regard. People thought that the media actually was fighting for the truth on behalf of the people. They don't really get that sense these days. It's just so partisan, hard to figure out. Vice, like any media organization, is trying to figure out how to do a better job at doing that. But back then, there were fewer outlets as well. There were fewer sources of information. Now you don't even have to be an outlet. You can be at home in your underwear putting stuff out. <laughs> you know? It's a fun mental picture for everyone. Um, Mr. Rishi, I want to ask you about how citizens in different countries, here in the U.S. in, in particular, but also because you, you've reported from so many places where this is a problem. We talked a little bit about some people are taking efforts now. They'll label stories fake news on social media. They're trying to get ahead of it. But is it different when the misinformation is coming from the highest levels, when you have well, a president is, or leader? Well, I think this is absolutely crucial. I mean, the role your leadership plays. I mean, if the president himself is believing this fake news and retweeting it around the world, um, obviously it worries ca countries around the world and worries Americans and, and everyone else. Now, I mean, I give you the example of Pakistan because we, you know, we are past masters of, of, of tweeting and our leaders, unfortunately. Now, in the last two and a half years, the prime minister has not given a single press conference. But, and he has depended on his family members to send tweets out. But the whole point about tweets is that it does not involve the media. You can't question a, a tweet. I mean, you can, you can send a message back, but you can't really be face to face with the prime minister or, or a foreign minister and say, you know, you said that, what do you mean by that? You know? So the, the, the issue is um, uh, the last army chief, the, for the same reason, they, uh, the army stopped giving briefings. They would just give out tweets. Now, it's much easier, obviously, because you, who can argue against a tweet? You can't. Uh, or who can po point out fallacies or whatever. So this is a real problem where leadership is not playing the role it should be playing of, one, educating the public, providing a narrative to the public, which is, you know, for example, in, in, in Pakistan's case, should be more about counterterrorism, e extremism, and all, you know, all these kinds of issues, poverty, mm -hmm. women's rights, etc. But um, you, how can you establish a narrative if you're constantly distracted by other people's tweets, uh, your, you know, your own tweets. Um, and uh, leadership is not offering that, um, uh, leaders around the world are not offering that leadership. At the moment, I think they're bamboozled by you know, what you're saying, the potential and possibilities of um, uh, fake news and tweets and what that could mean. Um, but we have to have a more responsible leadership around the world. And you know, uh, uh, people should be um, raising this issue much more categorically than they have been. Yes. Yeah, I would just say, you know, in, in some ways, author you see with authoritarian regimes, they take the idea of fake news and turn it on its head. Mm -hmm. yes. And it almost becomes, well, fake news is something I don't agree with, and we are going to fight fake news. But what that really means is they want to put more pressure on the mainstream media and eliminate, you know, dissenting voices. So, to Ahmed's point, having good, solid leadership at the top of a country, uh, probably one of the primary things we're going to hope for. I think another point and problematic aspect of this is what uh, Razi mentioned, that media has become so commercial and capitalist. And a, a lot of the uh, traditional old fake news, as you mentioned in the supermarket and so on, um, uh, magazines, there is a commercial motive. Um, you know, sensationalist headlines sell more. The pizza story got more clicks, more hits, because it was sensationalist, motivated uh, uh, for commercial gain. You know, so that at least is a, is a point on which you could figure out how to put some pressure, because it is a, a single point of motivation. I think that needs to be thought through. You're saying there could be some market pressure, some yeah, financial penalties, yeah. because certainly yeah. there is a huge yeah. business. Yes, to fake is. news now. There were Huge entire you know, business. organizations, companies started and made a lot of money over this, just this last election cycle yeah. alone. I mean, sadly, <laughs> fake news, as is evident, is virtually free to put out. Real news, as you were talking about, the traditional outlets becoming more responsible, really careful with their sourcing and all the rest, which they do need to do. I think we'd all agree. That's expensive. How many you know, uh, uh, print media and others have withdrawn their foreign correspondence because it's too expensive to uh, support them. 
these days. So that balance needs to somehow be recalibrated, I think. I just find it incredibly sad that now tweets are, are always being seen as official in the sense that the New York Times will publish a tweet on the front page. Um, a television will publish, you know, CNN will publish all the tweets that the president has written that day, one after another, as though this was a, a legitimate form of media communication. When the fact is that you know half of these tweets are um, they have to be checked because they may be infactual, they may tell lies, um, etc. And the media, the mainstream media, doesn't have time to check all this, and uh, so they you know they just paste up everything, and uh, so we are getting leaders, our leaders, putting out half truths basically, and the mainstream media picking this up, and that is really. Can, really dangerous. Can we afford to ignore them, though, when you have the, the arguably the most powerful leader in the world putting out a message of some kind? Should media ignore it because it came in the form of a tweet? No, I mean, it's, but he, he understands sort of the short attention span economy, which, you know, it's sort of linked also to people just reading headlines and not really going into the body of stories. It all sort of falls into place. There's such an avalanche of information that lands up. And if you think about it, the, the biggest newspaper in the world, in a sense, is Facebook. 1.8 billion, 1.9 billion people. That's where a lot of them get their news. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are more inclined to believe fake news than people who don't use Facebook. And also, in many cases, more inclined to vote. So um, you can't ignore what the president is doing. It's being done in a very calculated way. And in a sense, the president of this country has made a very fertile ground for the proliferation of fake news with his campaign and his anti-establishment mode and his embrace of conspiracy theories, he attracted to him a lot of far-right or white supremacists, all kinds of groups who did fake news on his behalf. And we also know now the Russian government, you know, produced fake news on his behalf. It's, uh, it's, it's really sort of a treacherous situation. But you're shaking your head the same way we do every day. It's like, I don't know what to do about this. Look, there's an example actually developing in real time. We have the French presidential election right. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, there was this huge dump of documents related to Emmanuel Macron's, uh, the center-left candidate's campaign. And what the reporting overnight is showing that even though the dump may have come from wherever it came from, the amplification came from the U.S. There were a bunch of alt-right bots and accounts that then spread the hashtag Macron leaks and that is how the message got out there so it doesn't you know misinformation doesn't sort of live by national borders either which is another new problem that needs to be faced and, and, and this information becomes incredibly important you know uh, in a country which has is just experiencing its first experience of fake news mm -hmm. I mean America now has been through this for the last two three years and I think a lot of people got used to it but in France it's a complete novelty you know and I think in a lot of European countries it's a, it's you know this is a complete novelty Still. But I think, if I may, that what I noticed with the French story is that immediately it was known that it was fake news and that, right. uh, you know, there was a criticism of that leak um, or dump of documents so that it, almost in real time there was that counter. It, it didn't take a week or two for people to figure out what had happened, mm -hmm. which I think is a result of the experience here, even mm -hmm. though it's their first big confrontation with this. I think there was something learned from our experience. So people will know, you know, uh, that, uh, that this was fake. Now they may choose to believe it anyway, but at least there would have been the message out that it was a... Pe it people have really yet to grasp the, the, the full power of the Internet. And the Ambassador's point about media literacy, very, very important. If, if, you, if, you, if you think about it, Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the Internet, actually, not, not Al Gore, but he actually did. He was quoted recently, and he said, the three things in the world, they're going to make the Internet not what it was supposed to be, which was supposed to be something to unite mankind and have its overall betterment. He put fake news on the top of a thing that it has to be able to deal with that. By the way, the other two things were cyber terrorism and citizen surveillance. And if you think about just those three things, they are such huge issues. Mm -hmm. And they go so against what we thought the internet was really gonna be about. But people haven't really figured out how powerful this medium is and what a role it plays in people's lives and how it's now gonna affect. It's affected so many industries. 
But now it's going to affect, you know, the whole body politic in a, in a way we, I think, never imagined. We talked a little bit about the failure of the news media to accurately maybe even give credit to the power of that fake news and abdicate some of the responsibilities along the way. I'm curious, in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan where you have this burgeoning new media, right, this proliferation of cable news channels and everyone's fighting for the same piece of the pie and everyone has to get the first breaking news tag up, how do you either start that culture so that it doesn't lend itself towards misinformation, or, or how do you keep it on rails once it is out there? As someone who's helped to start new media in Afghanistan, you've overseen some of the new channels as they've launched there in recent years. What do you tell them? What are the guidelines? For journalists? I'm sorry, I missed yeah. part. Well, I mean, it goes back to what Ahmed said. I mean, the the, the, the I think in Pakistan what you find, I don't, I'm not by no means a real expert, but you have a lot of competitive news channels mm -hmm. trying to beat each other in the ratings and trying to beat people to stories and maybe the reporting isn't as solid as it should be. They're, it's, they're operating in a rather partisan environment. We see the same thing here in the United States. You know, going back to uh, your roots of doing good reporting and trying to, you know, be of good service to the people would be what you would want people to do, but quite often you might find that the ratings for your network are going to probably be higher if you adopt a more partisan tone. That's just the way things are, and that's really unfortunate. I don't know really what the answer is. You know, you've seen from time to time here a network would try and be more non-ideological, mm -hmm. like CNN, for example, in this country. They're being outflanked now on the right and the left by other two other news channels, and they're trying to be the, you know, president. Trump might call them the fake news network, but they're trying to really be is non rather nonpartisan, mm -hmm. and they're struggling with it. I'll, I'll you know really take a risk and say very blatantly that I think that uh, the the media has really deteriorated in Pakistan, unfortunately. When the opening of these channels happened, and by the way, under a military ruler, General Musharraf, um, there was enormous hope and splurge in investigative reporting and. Um, uh, fil short films, uh, documentaries, etc. There's almost nothing now except the cheapest form of television, which is the talk show. Um, and the talk shows are quite easy to manipulate. Um, you can, you'll always have uh, um, a, a member of the right wing or a, or a, a pro-government guy sitting there giving the line, as it were. And anchors are, are often, um, you know, asked and and told, um, you know, to manipulate such talk shows. Now, I think, you know, there's, there's, just, there's no investigative reporting. There's very little um, film reports, documentaries, is what TV does best of all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we're really suffering because of this lack of information. And, and as you say, there's just a storm of Twitter feeds. You know, the Prime Minister tweeted this, the Army has just tweeted this, the so-and-so has just tweeted this. And that does not constitute journalism. In, you know, even an old-fashioned guy like myself, who's been in the business for 40 years, I mean, I, this is not journalism. Do you tweet? Sorry? Do you tweet? Are I you on Twitter? Tweet. No, I refuse yeah. to tweet. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you, if you want to read me, read me. But, I, you know, you can't read me in 40, whatever it is, 140, you know. So I, I, I don't tweet. I mean, I mean, maybe I'm very backward, and uh, maybe I should tweet, and tweet the truth rather than tweet what, you know, people imagine. But... Um, I think this is a huge, huge concern um, for the media. And then, of course, there are many areas of the media have been put off by the government. I mean, um, whether it's uh, Balochistan or the nuclear program or criticism of the Chinese package or... Mm -hmm. I mean, there are whole sorts of areas which are off-limits to the media. Um, but that, you know, the media can fight back. I mean, it can push the envelope on these issues. But it can't if it is being fed this constant sea and flood of tweets. Um, many of them are completely made up and lies. I mean, the other day, a, a leading political figure said that the prime minister had offered him 10 billion, 10 billion rupees, or um, you know, to to uh, to tell a lie, basically. You know, now I mean, you know, this was headlines for like two or three days. I mean, the uh, um, prime minister was denying it; he was denying it. The tweet war was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's extraordinary waste of time. But over to your point, though, <laughs> earlier, as you mentioned, you, in, at State Department level, yeah. got in the trenches there. You yeah. established your social media accounts that were going to fight back message by message. Has it worked? Um, in some instances, yes, and you have, to, you have to do it. I mean, 
I actually respect Ahmed for not getting in the tweet war, but you know, the US government really felt it had no, no choice. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say another thing, and I, I'm curious, Ahmed, whether you think at some point, because I think in America now, when you talk to mainstream, you know, old school journalists at the New York Times or the Washington Post and established outlets, uh, they are really feeling reinvigorated um, uh, for the fight, and they feel that they're getting more support now yeah. from their owners and so on mm -hmm. to take at least a, a few steps away from the pure, um, you know, capitalist comp commercial competition and try to start, you know, reestablishing those standards. Not that they lost them altogether, but they all feel that they did a little bit and it's time to pull up their socks. And I think there's a real consciousness about that um, that is, um, you know, that is, is going to have some ripple effect. I mean, she says, Miss Pollyanna here. You know, <laughs> there's a reason to be yeah. hopeful. There is. Subscriptions yeah. are up in yeah. a lot of places, and there's a lot more money going in. It does take money, though, yeah. to invest in good journalism, to invest in the kind of things that can counter fake news. From a business perspective, Mr. Preston, I'm curious, where do you think that should be coming from? Should there be more government funding for independent news sources? Well, I don't know as if gov government funding is the answer. It's at least in, in, in this country probably wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for, for Pakistan per se. But um, what you see now is the ambassador said some of the, the more mainstream news organizations here, they've been fighting their own battle with the Internet, which is just how to survive, you know, losing all their classified ads and all these other sources of revenue and having to scale back all their foreign bureaus and so forth. And a hopeful sign we see is that their digital business they used to say analog dollars to digital pennies. You know, mm -hmm. as they lose their advertising, they're make, not really making it up in digital. But they are beginning, I think the New York Times just had their biggest quarter. They added like 300,000 digital subscribers. So you got to go, yeah. That means, you know, it's not dependent on ratings. It's dependent on quality reporting. And, and that's going to allow them to do a better job. I'm, I'm, I think the, this transformation to, um, from print you know, actual physical papers to digital and having people subscribe to it is, it's, it's, it's a long transition, but we might be seeing now, not just with print, but also we see it in the music business where people are subscribing to things and revenue is beginning to flow and these, begin, these businesses are a little more robust and can afford to do a better job. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's a positive trend line we see in this whole matrix of fake news. What, what, what I mean, where I think the, the, the real fear is that what we've seen with Trump is the um, a desire to cut back on, uh, to actually cancel NPR and PBS. I mean, that would be a total disaster. I mean, you know, I mean, one thing I really um, <laughs> get very worked up about, when you're in America, you, you cannot see a TV channel which will give you in half an hour a synopsis of the news. I mean, CNN here, does, we have a much better CNN abroad, but in America, CNN is awful. It's just running alongside Fox and, you know, all the others. It's just panel talk shows. Um, you want a quick summary of the news, I mean, you know, NPR would, 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 would give you that. Um, and N NPR was very educative, as, as the BBC is, in fact, especially for young people and all the rest who take an interest in politics. Now, if these, um, if these public services, and they are, remember, public services, if they go, what is going to be left? I mean, what is the, Amer the American people are just going to be bombarded with, you know, um, this kind of fake news and tweets and, and, and channels that are, you know, basically talk shows and nothing else. You know, NPR ratings are up, which is mm -hmm. another healthy sign. Despite the fact that the funding may be cut, which hopefully doesn't happen, there, there are more people are listening to it than ever before. And PBS's and ratings, and PBS are, up as well. ratings are up too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So but there hunger. is, uh, I'll just take a moment to say that I think ABC News is doing their best to uh, <laughs> try to uh, step up to this new game we live in now. Uh, at the end of that. But look, there is this relationship between the information that's going out and the people who are consuming it, right? And there's an element of trust in all of this. And if, look, the president ran on a lot of misinformation. He objectively lied a lot during the campaign, and it worked. There was an audience for it. The fake news organizations make money because people read them. So how do you change that dynamic? Because if there's always a market for it, that's always going to that's always going to exist. I'm looking well, for I answers think here. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you know, you, the media has to 
be able to police it better and show up um, uh, the fake news. Have you seen, I don't know if you've seen, I mean, if you see Homeland anymore, but you know, the sixth season of Homeland, mm -hmm. it has an amazing episode on fake news. And you know, they go down into the, into the basement of some huge Washington building, and there are like 500 people there putting out on computers fake news, you know. And then, you know, on one day you suddenly bombard the whole, everybody's computer with this fake news and everybody thinks it's true. And it's quite an amazing de depiction of what you know, Tom was talking about, about what could be done. I mean, with, with the basement and 500 people and computers. Absolutely. It's simple. But I think, uh, and I may, again, being, being a little bit Pollyannish here, but I, I don't think so. I think throughout this country, there is a certain amount of grassroots uh, organizing, in part to figure out what happened in this you know, in this last election, but along with it, um, uh, what would be, I think, a growing demand to to um, hold accountable many institutions, including news. I think that's coming, and I think at some point there will be a demand for a return to a sort of what would you call it curatorial system. Uh, you mentioned how we're all totally drowning in whether it's tweets or you know fake or unfake too much information from the internet none of us can individually sort through that mm -hmm. and i think ultimately people are going to require and perhaps demand some sort of legitimate sorting of that um, by responsible news players that they can trust and that you you know in other words sort of a backlash to what's happened out of which will grow a slightly different system, mm -hmm. one can hope. A thought is to sort of go to the source and, you know, go to Facebook, the world's biggest newsstand. They, they have been able, they, they need to create, they have need to be pressured to be put on them. Who, they need, they have a, a desire for as much information as possible to populate their news feeds and they don't really discriminate about mm -hmm. it. But they have been able with an algorithms to get pornography off. They've been able to get off breastfeeding. They've been able to get off a lot of terrorist messaging and so forth. Pressure Not that can, we put breastfeeding in the same category as terrorist no. messaging. <laughs> no, I don't. It's clear. But it was a big issue for them. They said they in made certain a mistake places, with that. You know, but yeah. Lord knows. We could have gone for more. Just but, for the live stream audience yeah, following yeah. along. That's not what we're saying. But <laughs> there... You know, the idea that they would find, you know, with the aid of artificial intelligence, which is coming along, a better algorithm and better methodology to mm -hmm. find fake news and really, you know, they really have to, need to have their feet held at a fire a bit more to do a bit more to deal with the problem that they, in a sense, have created. And that's not being done. They're, they're flagging things now, and it's, yeah, I don't think it's really quite adequate compared to what could happen. Um, I have hours worth of more questions for you, but I'm sure the room does as well. So, should we turn it over? Yeah. And let's see if anyone out there has any questions for the panel. I can barely see with the lights, but I think right down here in the front. Yes? Hi. Uh, so, my question is actually going to uh, the literature. So, I can think of, I mean, what, what's the responsibility of the literature and authors have? And the two examples that come to mind is G.S. Nightfall, uh, whom uh, the late Craig Wildland said uh, shouldn't be writing, he should be selling sausages. And the other is Grand Green, uh, who on the flip side of it. So how do they help create this environment? How do they help create what? How do they help fight? You're saying how do they help counter some of the fake news narratives? Authors, uh, writers, novelists, well, people you know, who are more like invested Naipaul, in it. When you read his, um, you know, his, his two books on uh, the Islamic world, I mean, look, th these were personal opinions. Um, um, uh, uh, these were his own personal opinions, which uh, disgusted a lot of people, and, and got some support from, from, from his reading. And because he was Naipaul, you had to read it. I mean, this was, uh, you know, um, a Nobel Prize winning um, uh, novel. Um, novelists don't often go into, you know, non-fiction, uh, the fiction novelists don't often go well into non-fiction writing uh, of politics and other things. And I think Naipaul is a prime example. But the whole debate at that time about Naipaul's books was not about um, um, you know, whether he's faking it or telling lies or, you know, he would report events and Hindu festivals, Muslim festivals, whatever, in a particular way which would either annoy a lot of people or get a lot of people loved. 
But it wasn't a question that he was lying to you. I mean, which is what is happening now. I think that's the difference. More questions, right here in the front. So the advertising industry has been faking you diabetes where the, the company fought and fought and fought to keep news away from people who were being killed by this particular drug. So this has been going on for a very long time. I think it's an extension of what the ad industry has done, which has now seeped through uh, the entire fabric of society. And look, look at what Philip Morris is doing with cigarettes. It's this idea of information Climate warfare, well. right? This is this has always been uh, this has always been around. So I, I, the other question attached to this is, what is different now? We're, I mean, is it just because the president of the U.S. said that there's a thing called fake news that we're all talking about it? It's the technology. I mean, um, yeah. I, I really think the proliferation of it because yes. of the internet. Yeah. It's changed the game. And as you pointed out, in that, the technology is only going to move forward. Right. So, I mean, we've just yeah. begun to deal, I mean, to see what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, one, one obvious, oh, one of the ways in which we can counter it is legislation. Why not criminalize? There's laws, the laws against fraud. So why can't there be penalties of various kinds and to the extent of even criminalizing people who actually issue fake news? What do you make of that? It's just much harder to identify them and regulate them, again, because of the Internet phenomenon. And They're the far flung. There are many of them. Aware, and, uh, you know, and if you have someone in one around. country amplifying a message yeah. that does the real damage to a message that was created in another country, where, what legislation matters? No, but right? all, all laws have difficulties in implementation. Right? So this is just another barrier. It will prevent, stop, it won't stop it completely, it won't mm -hmm. eliminate it, but that's one step society can take. Yeah, I think, I think you know, this is a step that they can take, certainly, uh, when you're dealing, for example, with fake news about drugs, uh, things that actually kill people, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or women, you know, um, uh, giving birth or, or anything like that when you have fake news on, on, on such issues. Um, then I do hope that there will be some kind of criminalization process. But I think it will be very slow to start. Back out. Yes, right there in the middle. Um, so, well, apparently it was my family. That was my father. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Sorry, yeah. So obviously it's incumbent upon the media to push back uh, against identifying what, what is fake news um, and offering the truth, the alternative. Um, and, but I, my, I myself am a journalist and I felt a little, in a way, responsible for Trump's success because a lot of it was because of the media's obsession with his campaign. Um, not entirely, but I think that played a huge role. So do you think it's uh, the media should be... Um, it's incumbent upon the media to also discern what stories to highlight and what stories to engage with. And actually, in some cases, is it more responsible to ignore these stories? What do you think? This, this goes back to the issue you raised with, with Twitter, which is you know, when, the, when the information is out there, when the misinformation is first seeded, can the media just ignore it? Or do they have to address it? Well, it depends who's saying it. You know, I mean, if it's the president, you can't ignore it, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to answer it. But, yeah, I think there should be much more discrimination by the media as to how, what, what kind of Twitter feed and who and, and you know, what they release as their news. Um, and, and that is one way that, you know, they can be, um, that this kind of fake news can be policed in a way, internally by news organizations. I think one thing news organizations will have to do I mean, I was encouraged by Facebook, who are now saying they're going to monitor all these bad things much closer. But news organizations should also be doing the same thing and making sure that what you know, news they put up is, is not nonsense. I think um, I've heard a lot of journalists talk in the advent of the election um, about, okay, what did we really participate in a way in, in getting President Trump elected? And what really is balance? And one example that was given was that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton had 
you know, two distinctly defined problems. The emails and um, Benghazi, mm -hmm. and, and the foundation, say three. Whereas Trump, every day, had so many, you know, challenging things to say and so on. And so it was really three against a thousand, yet the way they presented it, it made the candidates look the same. So they're thinking, okay, how do we correct that sort of, it was intended to be a balance, but it turned into an imbalance, an inaccurate portrayal of the character traits of these two candidates, mm -hmm. if you will. So I, I hear a lot of thinking going on among American journalists about that kind of thing. I yeah. have to end. Sorry? We have to end. Oh, I, I have a card in the front that says one minute. One minute means one more question, though. <laughs> so how about all the way in the back there? I see someone waving a hand. Yeah. yeah thank you. I just wanted to bring maybe some hope to this conversation, at least uh, you know, some options to uh, uh, fighting fake news. I think there's a microphone coming to you, too. If you hang on just one second. There you go. I'm French, by the way, so I have a little different, you know, I'm interested in Pakistan and I work in the U.S., so it's a kind of a, a, obviously interested in what happened even last night, but um, uh, there's many ways to fight fake news. Uh, I, I, you know, I was in the press, in, a, in journalism business for a long time, but I'm working now, for, for example, for something called The Conversation, which is bringing scholars to write about the news in collaboration with journalists. And it's only five years old, but it's six websites around the world. We're working with the Global South, with Pakistan, with a lot of Pakistani authors. And it's re reaching out to 45 million people a month. So there is an audience for real news and expertise, you know, and there's also an audience for fake news. One of the issues, I think, in terms of fake news is also the use of the internet and the new generation. And these, I mean, there is a need for education and edu educating people. And I think we have a responsibility in the media, but also in, you know, in schools and everything else, you know, I have young kids and they don't see the difference, they don't make the difference. They, they read everything at the same level and I think there is there, is there an education to be made, uh, especially in developing countries as well, where the access, you know, we have access and, you know, maybe you don't, you don't make the difference between those news. And the other side of it, obviously, um, the conversation is non-profit. It's a total different model because you need money to fake, you know, to fight fake news. And, and as we all know, uh, the media is losing money all around the world. I mean, in France, it's the case. In the case in Europe, it's the case, you know, in, in the U.S. as well. So it's the, I think there's two main sides to it. And mm -hmm. my question is, in terms of education, what can we do for the young generation to be aware that there is something out there that has nothing to do with news and is not based on reality, especially in the U.S., when the president is basically tweeting fake news every morning? Why doesn't everyone have a... a Let's uh, hack at that. What, what role does education play or other institutions in fighting this? Media literacy yeah. huge, has to be a huge yeah. priority. We've had this whole new thing of the internet, the web, come into our lives and very little time has been taken to help teach people how to deal with it. Now that we see some of its, you know, sort of lesser manifestations like fake news. Mm -hmm. Media literacy, it should be taught in schools. Mr. Rashid, what do you think of it? Education, does that have an important role? Yeah, I mean, it's hugely important. Uh, unfortunately, the syllabus and texts that uh, we in Pakistan are dealing with are like um, as, as, as 40, 50 years old. Um, and they deal with a lot of misrepresentation of minorities, about other religions, etc. And we need a whole revamping of textbooks. And I think what they should also include very much is, a, is, a, is, a, is the subject matter of, you know, um, um, what Tom was talking about that's really needed mm -hmm. um, because I think um, the, in, in a sense if you're half educated or lesser educated um, the impact of these fake news and lies and all the rest of it uh, become even greater and right. so they, this has to be safeguarded again. Last word for you Ambassador you know, I just was going to mention a program that I heard about recently in e-civics that uh, former uh, Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is, is working on um, you know, an interactive uh, program for, for young children on civics, civic responsibility, basic constitutional rights and so on that have sadly gotten short shrift even in our education system in recent years. But again, using the technology which uh, draws young people in uh, to communicate a sense of civic responsibility and awareness of 
uh, of news and its role and government and its role and civil society and its role and so on. And I think all of those things need to be supported. Ambassador Rafel, Ahmed Rashid, Tom Preston, thank you so much for your time today. Please join me in thanking you.